So Rob went very classy for the intro with Tim. Usually, <laughs> it's usually you know, music this time. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's train wreck or rock and roll or hip hop. So Rob, uh, Rob this, decided to keep it classy uh, for Tim. Yeah, <laughs> Go, what's going on, boys? This is, we were planning this for a while. We finally were able to put it together. Well, yeah, yeah. Credit to both of these gentlemen. They 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 managed to reschedule twice for me. So I really appreciate uh, your hospitality. Oh, please. Yeah. Well, you were I, down on the, the COVID dumps the first time, right? Oh, uh, yeah. It was just a insane week of COVID and, you know, all the kids and it was a crazy week. So, but yeah. me and, me oh, and yeah. Rob have actually said, like, if it, I don't think our channel exists without Meaning of Catholic first, right? Uh, oh, like, definitely not. Like, part of the reason we even started doing this was because of your approach to things and seeing how you were able to have conversations with people without it turning ugly and uh, especially different points of view. And I think there was this uh, kind of like a movement uh, in like the way trads talked where it was guilt by association and like they would cut somebody out if they said, said like the slightest wrong thing. And, you know, I was starting to see uh, trads say things about like the Scott Hans and the, because they weren't a hundred percent on board with every single thing. And it was like, these are some of the guys that helped me come into the faith, taught me the faith. And I just feel like we do need to keep a, a, an absolute dialogue with everyone. Whoever has a, you know, men of goodwill need to be able to have conversations when they disagree, especially. Absolutely. Uh, that's, that's the whole point of being a Catholic is uh, you have to be at least Catholic enough to truly call yourself Catholic. But once you're there, then there's a ton of spectrum within that, within the Catholicism. And I, that's, that's certainly my, 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 one of my points of view is that there is a, a total breakdown of the rival schools of Christendom. So there's all these different schools mm -hmm. of thought where we can actually bounce each other, you know, sharpen each other, have a fruitful, this is a fruitful debate. Um, there's just like one party that says all the other parties of like it's it's I, I often I, I knock on Thomas, but it's 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 the worst when um, one form of Thomism wants to exclude <laughs> other forms of Thomism. It's like, man, like <laughs> we're all in communion here, please. Yeah. And, and if we have goodwill, it's like uh, it's hard to to really keep men who disagree from especially with, like we've been going over temperaments and stuff. I mean, you get a couple of cholerics together and they just. They want to burn everything down. So it's, yeah, that, it's, yeah, that's that's the that's a good point because because the choleric temperament's like um, I think it's the sanguine that gets inflamed but goes like calms down quickly. Yep. But the cleric is the one that gets inflamed quickly, but then it stays. Mm -hmm. and so you get bitter and you're. Um, I, I think that it, it's it, it, I mean, online sucks. I mean, it, it's yeah. terrible. Online is like there's there's so great potential. So great potential. That's what we're trying to exploit with avoiding Babylon with medium Catholic. But there's so many limits to being able to express yourself in, you know, 120 characters or whatever. And if your if your temperament is affecting that, then somebody of a uh, like an opposite temperament uh, reads that and thinks, you know, oh, you meant this and this and this, but really it's like your temperament coming out. So it's just a internet can be a uh, 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 the devil's playground for sure. Oh yeah, for oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, so this whole conversation came up because there was a set of contest on Twitter telling me that Benedict the Sixteenth is a heretic, and they started sending me these little clips and uh, that that Benedict had said when he was Ratzinger, he was not Pope at the time, but Benedict is a uh, theologian who I think likes to explore different topics and. I don't think he was speaking in a defide sense where it was like, oh, this is, you know, anything. I think he was just trying to, there was a lot of that going on after the council where guys were trying to just, you know, the new belt Halo G, they wanted to explore new, new ideas and concepts and stuff. So at first, when we saw the, the couple of things, the person sent me on the Benedict, I think we were like, oh, we could probably, you know, show Benedict is within the lines there. But then, Tim had just said this is a little bit more complicated than he had anticipated right away. So what, what did you mean by that, Tim? Yeah, well, it's similar to the, there's this passage in Jesus of Nazareth that I put in my own book that appears to support a limited inerrancy of the scripture, but it's not totally clear. And I, I think this is a passage where there is a certain appearance of 
uh, a confusion or a, an ambiguity. Um, and I, I, but I would, I would assert that we have to have a little bit more solid evidence to accuse someone of heresy, um, because I think this is an instance of um, a, a lot of different factors, which we can get into. But there is a certain, there are, there is actually a, a huge distinction between the de fide proposition about the resurrection of the body. Mm -hmm. There is actually speculation among theologians on certain factors of that. And so I think that Brassiger is, is sort of playing in these waters here a little bit. Tim, do you know, uh, because you, I, were you ever actually Eastern Orthodox or were you just studying it? Yes, I was Eastern Orthodox. Now, what, what, what is their uh, concept? Do they have a totally different understanding of the resurrection of the body? Like what, because a lot of these defeat statements Rob's going to read are after the split. So I don't know if they made any definitive statements actually, on actually a lot of them are actually before oh are they okay a lot of it was seemed to be able to seem to have been worked out before the final split okay yeah so i i've heard like uh pajot and maybe jay dyer say things along the lines of uh uh that it's not an actual bodily resurrection and maybe it's like whoop, uh, out. i think uh pajot explains it like there are bodies that like even I, you know what? He's so difficult to explain. I don't even know if I would. I probably butcher what he meant. I was just wondering what the Eastern Orthodox view of it is compared to ours. Well, I I, I don't think I can speak expertly to that. But one thing I can say is it, it. So Ludwig Ott, when you get into, I've got the text here. When you get into the certain speculative area where, okay, the de fide proposition is basically that you resurrect with your own body that you have now. And then we also know that it's going to be slight, it's going to also going to be different than the body you have now. It's mm -hmm. like a both and. That's the day fide part. But then the speculation comes in as to, well, how exactly does that happen now? So like, how uh, is it your soul reconstitutes the matter, or you have that same matter that it's reconstituted than the soul? And there's all these distinctions. Well, one of them is Aristotle, that there in the West there was a uh, resource among, re resourcing of Aristotle in the West, and he became uh, one of the dominant philosophical forces, which became um, forming a lot of the Latin theology. And that is not something that Eastern Orthodoxy ever really, um, they, they had Aristotle, they've always had Aristotle, he obviously he's a Greek, but the, the philosophy, the philosophical mindset of the, the Greek fathers has always been Neoplatonism and not a dominant dominant Aristotelian framework. And in the in the Roman Catholic Church, since the the so-called high Middle Ages and the resource in Aristotle, there's always been these certain rival philosophical schools because the Franciscan school follows the more Neoplatonic philosophical method. And so Scotus actually has a different view than the Thomas on this. Mm -hmm. And that's because of these different things. So I mean the, the only thing I can say is that Eastern Orthodox would follow that um, the Neoplatonic format. And their sort of framework for answering those questions. Yeah. So um, the thing is about the resurrection of the body. There are these strange accounts in Scripture, where uh, even on the road to Emmaus, you have the two got two men are walking on the road to Emmaus, discussing all these things, and then Jesus just joins them, but they don't recognize him. And it says that their eyes were kept from recognizing them, uh, recognizing him. Now he walks with them, and he starts to go over the scriptures with them. Now. You have to realize these are the Old Testament scriptures he's going through, right? That must have been the most unbelievable Bible study of all time in the history of like the world. Like what I would give to have heard uh, Jesus break down the Old Testament and reveal the new in the old would have been something that is, must have been unbelievable. So now at the end, when they break the bread is when he is revealed to them and he disappears from their sight. That's one account. Then there's another account where Mary Magdalene sees him and he says, do not touch me. I have not yet ascended to my father. But And that's in John's, go uh, John's gospel. And then in the next chapter, John, he's appearing in the locked room, like as if he could walk through walls and he allows Thomas to touch him. So there is some like strangeness about all these resurrection accounts that aren't like 100% clear in scripture. And it was kind of exciting to go back and reread all of those accounts in the past two days. It was interesting. Yeah, that, that's great. I'm glad that you brought up the road to Emmaus. That's that's always been pretty much my favorite resurrection account. 
because of the line, did not our hearts burn within us when he opened the scriptures? That, that always like gets me. Um, but I think that the one of the main, uh, you just mentioned, speaking about the body, he says, touch me not, but then he says, St. Tom, Thomas, touch me. Um, but the, And then the, the main moment, too, in many of the accounts is that he eats food. Mm -hmm. So he's proving that he's not a ghost. But the, as you said, his body is clearly not operating like a normal body. So there's, we know, and I think this is where the de fide proposition is, that the de fide is, yes, it is your same person, your same body, in the sense that that's you. Like, I, th I think of the face. When I was thinking about this, I think the face is kind of what gives you away because um, it, it's your body. Your body is, is your face and you recognize somebody. But like you said, they didn't always recognize him. Sometimes yeah. he had to say their say their names. Um, so it is your same body because it can eat. Jesus's body could eat. Um, but it could also, it was impassable. Like it could go through walls apparently or. It, yeah, but it wasn't your same body. So it's the same body, but it's not your same body. Yeah, so that's where I think that there's this little bit of leeway for where Benedict was able to like theorize on things. But I do think Benedict is pushing He's pushing it in his text, right? So um, what do you guys think we should go through first? Should we go through what the church teaches and then kind of explore Benedict? Or do you think we should? I, I mean, well, do we, we, would, uh, yeah, I don't know. If yeah, we Rob, want you want to read some of those day fee day yeah. statements? That might be yep. a good place to get We can definitely do that. This conversation. So first, um, the first book I have sections of it is, is Ott. So Ott, uh, for those of you who don't know, list... Um, he, he lists a theological note, the more or less the almost the certitude of each statement. And for those of you who are not familiar with those, I'm sure most of you have have watched Meaning of Catholic before and have seen Tim go over this. But for those of you who haven't, these are the theological notes that Ott uses. Um, so the de fede statements, well, really the first four are are levels of cert certainty that we have to have to believe on pain of sin. Correct him. Uh, yes. So any of the, any of the statements of those first four, we, we have to have to believe. Um, so why don't, why don't you that, read them? Let's let's. Okay. So D fate. So when, when someone says dogma, they're usually talking about something that's one of the first two, a, a D feed fee day statement. Um, it is it means of the faith as it says. So it's absolutely explicit in, in scripture, in tradition, and it's explicitly defined by the the highest church authority. So that's either like an ecumenical council or, um, or um, when the the pope is speaking ex cathedra. Um, so any denial of a statement like that is is heresy. Then there's um. The, the next level is also de fide, but it's not necessarily explicit in scripture or tradition. Um, it's implicit in those, but it's still explicitly defined by the church. So the assumption would be a statement like that. And that's also uh, heresy if you if you disagree with that. But then going down lower, we have something that's proximate to the faith. So it's um, kind of like generally understood by all the theologians, not like theologian in the modern sense, but like in the scholastic sort of sense of the word um, it's explicit in scripture and tradition but it's not actually defined by a council or by a, a, an ex cathedra statement so that's you know the blessed trinity can only be known through revelation and that's error proximate to heresy so that's still a you know very serious sin um, then below that is sententia certa theologically certain implicit in scripture and tradition not explicitly defined by the church so Marriage being, you know, mostly for the for for children um, would be something like that, um, and that is it's still the mortal sin of error there. But then when you go down lower, you have things like common teaching, which is implicit um, in tradition. Generally, you know, it's it's kind of just what the church more or less has has always taught, but it's not really explicit anywhere. Yeah. Um, and these you can object to if you have a good reason and that's not like oh i just i just disagree with it that's like you have seriously studied it and you have very good arguments against it and i, I would argue it's probably very hard for any lay person to really have a good reason in, in the sense that it means and the yeah, below that is just 
Yeah, I would just want to add that. Yeah, that's that's kind of the purview. Questioning number five is really the purview of theologians who are professionals. And I mean, we can we can uh, like I mean, you have like we, we, people can we can give our opinions, but it, it's just our opinions. Like, who are we to uh, uh, but we can't just throw out things um, that have been handed down to us, even if they're not totally rock solid. If there's a general view on X, Y, Z, but it's not totally um, definitively stated, we still can't throw that out. We have to have piety to um, give reverence to what has been handed down to us. So real quick. I, so I mentioned um, Mary Magdalene wasn't able to touch him. And then the next, like a couple of lines later, Thomas was. Now, Michael Hall says Mary Magdalene was not a consecrated priest and Thomas was. I, I had never heard that before. That makes sense, right? Like until Christ ascends to the Father, then he, in, in the Eucharistic Christ, Mary can receive him, but she can't before that because she's not a priest. Even then she can't, you know, touch him. Right. Hands, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> it depends. That's, Are we talking? <laughs> that, that's an interesting. Well, that was something that you brought up first, Anthony, was this connection between the resurrected body of Christ and the sacramental presence of Christ in the Eucharist with the road to Emmaus. Obviously that's the connection there. And that's, that's what uh, Ratzinger also makes the connection to between the resurrected body and the sacramental body. Yeah. Mm. All right. So Rob, now what are the actual defeat statements that the church has made that we have to believe about let the me, resurrection of the body? Let me bring those up. And, and there's a lot here and I can maybe read uh read more of them than just the statements if anyone wants but there there's a lot here so this is from i have sections from from ott uh, where he gives us the the theological note and then i have the actual documents that these teachings come from uh, that's from denziger's sources of catholic dogma and then i also have some uh teaching from the roman catechism if we want if we felt like we needed it but um basically starting very basically here um the the basic belief that we all that we have to believe is that all the dead will rise again on the last day with their bodies um, and this is professed in the Apostles' Creed, the Athanasian Creed. I mean, and some of the stuff from Denzinger will be these different creeds throughout the years. But this goes back to the very, the very first teachings of the church that all the dead will rise again. We believe the in the resurrection of the body. dead and the life of the world to come. In and the creed, it talks about how um, you know the opponents of this teaching were the Sadducees, uh, and Christ, you know kind of rebukes them them for that but i mean it talks about how the teachings uh develop from from the very you know the from the old testament that it wasn't necessarily just a christian belief starting with christ that it it goes back a long way um so yeah it says jesus rejects as an error the sadducees denial of the resurrection you err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of god for in the resurrection they shall ne neither marry nor be taken in marriage but shall be as the angels of god in heaven um so then going from there so that is the first thing that we have to believe as catholics um and there's there's this is all part of that same first statement but if we go back if we go down to the bottom here the next statement is the dead will rise again and this is de fide as well we have to believe this the dead will rise again with the same bodies um that they had on earth so it's not they're not different bodies they're not new body uh, now what about all of us really kind of, what about the people who have decomposed completely like their body will be reconstituted right i mean but it's but there's Thing about that not being the same body that's why I, I, it is a confusing thing that we believe it's not i know that we have like of course we will submit to what the church teaches and we will believe whatever the church says but that is a strange thing you're dealing with there right let's see here I, I, um, rob if you if you read uh letter b first few sentences of b i feel like that's helpful on that question that you just said anthony the identity must not be conceived in such a fashion that all material parts which at any time or at a definite moment belong to the earthly body will be present in the body at resurrection. Uh, 
as the human body always remains the same in spite of constant changing of a constituent matter. It suffices for the preservation of the identity. So basically it's in, in nature and essence, it's going to be, be the same body. Yeah. Because like it's we not going to be the same atoms necessarily. We have our friend Connor, right? Who Connor has, um, he has, he has no arms. Now, at the resurrection, I would I would imagine Connor is going to have a, a complete body. And, you know, I mean, that's a touchy subject. I hope Connor, if he hears this, he doesn't think I'm saying well, anything upsetting. There, I, but. I think some of the, the, the next teachings will probably kind of touch on, on that. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, it goes into some of the... Um, so actually, uh, like down here at the bottom. Paragraph. Yeah, right there. Go ahead. According to the general teaching, the body will rise again in complete integrity free from all distortions, malformations, and defect. Now, so one thing to, to recognize about Ott is like that that statement at the top of this paragraph was de fide, but these statements down below not necessarily are that. So this is general teaching, so I don't know if that's... Uh, Sounds like it's sententia communis is what my thought. I think that it would yeah. be means by general... So uh, your body will rise without any defect. So if you had, uh, let's say you had an amputation because you were in an accident, your body will, you know, you, those things will not be in your resurrected body or, you know, people, people are born with any kind of birth defects, things like that. Those things would all be, now that's not defeated you're saying, but it's, it's a general teaching. So the body will rise again in complete integrity, free from all distortions, malformations and defects. St. Thomas teaches man will rise again in the greatest possible natural perfection, therefore in the state of mature age. So I, we're, we're thinking probably around late twenties, I would imagine like your body at its greatest state yeah possibly yeah, the, um, <clears throat> here's here's the roman catechism <clears throat> it says uh there should be no deformity if some have been overburdened with flesh they shall not resume its entire weight all that exceeds the proper proportion shall be deemed superfluous on the other hand should the body be wasted by disease or old age or be emaciated from any other cause it shall be repaired by the divine power of christ who will not only restore the body unto us, but will repair whatever it shall have lost through the wretchedness of this life. That's awesome. That's pretty great. So now, what is the controversial stuff that Benedict says? Um, so the, the this was this whole debate started because a set of contest had made these claims that Ratzinger was a heretic, and that's you know. Now there's a lot of accusations are constantly thrown. Uh, from lay people toward the hierarchy that I'm always uncomfortable with. And it's not in our competency to make that judgment at all anyway. But Tim said that he did find some things that are a bit tough to to, to work out. So what, what were some of those things, Tim? Uh, sure, yeah. Let me just, um, I just wanted to note this part from Ott before we get to Ratzinger. Oh, yeah. um, and that's the, he, he mentions in the second to last paragraph of that page that we just, that Rob just put up there. He talks about how, uh, Durandus and John of Naples uh, said that all that was necessary was the, the soul was the same at the resurrection. And then the soul is reconstitu reconstitutes the matter. And then he said that the, and then he also mentions that the scholastics who followed Aristotle, they said that this, there was a spiritual soul, soul, which then molds every and any matter to its body. Um, and then there's the Scotist view as well, which says that there's some sort of special corporeal form distinct from the soul. So uh, the, the point is, this is the exact manner in which this happens is uh, a little ambiguous as to exactly how it happens. We know it's the same body. You will be you. I think that's that's the key thing I want to br bring up from Rassiker is that um, your body is you. Your face is you. Your face identifies that it's you and not somebody else. You're having and the de fide proposition that, that Rob just said is that it's the same body numerically. You're not getting a, somebody else's body. You're getting your body. Your body. You will be you at the resurrection. But we also know that um, there will be it will be a glorified body, as we just said. Um, and I think that the, the so for the first thing to note about the um, what this individual is fellow Catholic who has doubts about the papacy instead of a contest, whatever. Uh, the first part is that he left out the final three paragraphs of that whole section. Uh, and in the final three paragraphs, he says that 
he, he has emphasized the whole point of this passage seems to be that he is saying that there is no distinction between spirit and body, but rather in the resurrection, it will not be merely the physical, but it will be a, a, a what he says, uh, a body in a spiritual way, uh, which he says in this final final uh, two paragraphs, he says that the, quoting Ratziger, there is a final connection between matter and spirit in which the destiny of man and of the world is consummated, even if it is po impossible for us to today to define the nature of this connection. So th I think that this is cutting at that de fide is that we know that the all of you as a person will be resurrected and it will be glorified. So that means your body and your spirit, your, your matter and your spirit together in the resurrection. And just as all of the spiritual world and the physical world will be consummated together in the end of time. Um, but the difficulty is that one aspect of this is I, I talked to my friend Jennifer Bryson, who's a translator in German, and she's worked with Ratziger. And oh. she pointed out to me that one aspect of that is that he uses this German term called corpor, um, which is obviously seems to be related to corpus, uh, corporeal. And corpor is the word that's used for only the physical Oh, there, there she is. She's in the chat. Oh, wow. thank, awesome. thank you. Thank you. Jennifer, for the, I asked her about this because I don't know German, but um, she so she brought out some of the insights in this this text here um, because she definitely agreed that it's a difficult text to translate because uh, there's two different words for body that Ratzker used. There's Lieb and Corpor. Corpor is your scientific body that a doctor treats your scientific body. It gets sick. It dies. That's the corpor. The the lieb, the lieb. What's interesting is that lieb is how you translate hic as corpus meum. So the body of Christ in the Eucharist is a lieb, and also the mystical body of Christ, i.e., the Church, is also a lieb. So it's something that's <laughs> mystical and that's sacramental and that's bigger than merely and, your physical body that gets sick. And is that is that like related to the the German word like Leben? Like is that like more like life or living? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I cannot tell you how 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 awesome this is. Like I wasn't even like I didn't know where this was going to end up going and just to hear like that there so in, the English language is very um I, I I don't know. It doesn't have these well, words that mean different things. So when you're always translating back from Greek or you're translating from Latin, you always have to use like a few different terms to explain something. So it's like um uh in, in when John, uh, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he says, um, uh, "What does he say to him? Uh, one cannot uh, enter the kingdom oh, unless he Jennifer's is." Jennifer's clarifying the German. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know any German, so thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, when he says to Nicodemus, "Lave," um, one cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless he is born again of water and spirit. Like, there's different. He, it's actually wordplay he's doing in that thing. So I, I don't mean to sidetrack us. I just think this is really interesting that maybe from the English perspective to see what Ratzinger wrote, we're missing something in the context that he uses a different word for body well, in the German. It's, it, every translation is an interpretation in a sense, mm -hmm. right? So, so it, yeah, a lot can be lost there. Yeah, so it seems like the main... Um, because the main provocative question that he he raises, Ratzinger says, in the beginning of the passage, which is which is uh, difficult because it's it's problematic. It says his first question is, if this is the position, is there really such a thing as a resurrected body, or can the whole thing be reduced to a mere symbol of the immortality of the person? Now, at first, I took this as he was making this distinction between. Uh, Resurrection of the body is just a symbol or there's a physical body. But the real distinction I think that he's trying to make here is that um, the resurrected body is a reconstituted body and spirit as one it, as, as the as the same person in a spiritualized form, but still physical. But he's he's emphasizing that uh, like what he says here is in Paul's language, body, lab and spirit, Geist, are not opposites. 
the opposites are physical body, which is flesh lieb, and spiritual body. And in German, it says the lieb in a spiritual way. And so he's actually saying that the spiritual body, because in English, when we say spiritual body, that sounds like a ghost to me. Like, it doesn't seem like it's a real physical body. It's a spiritual body, right? It's not a real physical body. It's a spiritual body. So if you're making this contrast, like in English, I feel like the translation could have been better here. The opposites are physical body and spiritual body, because that seems to be, you just said physical and you just said spiritualist. So there, that's that's a big contrast there, because if, if Ratzinger is claiming that there is no physical resurrection of the body, it's just a spiritual resurrection of the body, that would be heresy. Because yeah. what we just read about. But he's not saying that in the German. He says it's a flesh lab. And 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 later on he says corpor. It's not the the resurrection of the corpor. So he's just he's not he's saying like your body is just not just raised again and you're gonna live like you did before. There's going right. to be a total difference between your body because it's <clears throat> a body in a spiritual way, it's a lab in a spiritual way. So that and that seems to be what he hammers home at the very end, which is the part that was cut off, cut off by your interlocutor. What, what is that? He's, he's emphasizing that there is this final constitution of man, which is just a microcosm of the entire cosmos, which is reconstituted. Mm -hmm. um, and he says at the end of that, the section that it is not um, in it, it is not a, a return to the fleshly body. That is the biological structure but it is the different form of life of the resurrection as shown in the risen Lord. Um, so I think that the, uh, and then he emphasizes at the end of this passage, how um, the resurrection gives us hope for the future. And he seems to be really speaking to 1967 West Germany at this point. This was what, at a time when Marxist mm -hmm. revolution was taking over West Germany yep. and they all had those dystopian views of everything. And so what he's really trying to get at, I think this is, I mean, what we need to look he's, at, we need to look at context. De-emphasizing materialism. De-emphasizing materialism. Oh, yeah, that's a great insight. I, I, yeah, de-emphasizing the communist dystopian materialism. Um, I'm going to get water while the smart guys talk because I'm <laughs> I'm so interested in this. I need well, water, that, but you, great, guys, uh, you, you guys are amazing, man. I love this that, conversation. That's a, that's a really great uh, comment, Rob. I, I like what you said. Um, because he, that seems to be what he's speaking at in the final paragraphs is that he's really speaking at, I can hear him like, this is a time when this was written when Joseph Ratzinger was a priest. I think it was 1967, I believe. But at that time he was the, he was a professor. Um, I can't remember which, was it Tubingen at that time? I think it was Tubingen at that time. Maybe, maybe Jennifer Bryson knows, but um, it was at the time where there were student, student Marxist revolts at his university. Like there was like he couldn't go to class. There were like students sit ins in the halls or whatever craziness. <laughs> but he was so he was uh, and he was actually packing the lecture halls because he was able to speak to this particular generation. So I think that we need to look at this in its context. One, Rassiger is not attempting to break down all of these dogmas that we just said. Like He's clearly not trying to say, oh, let's break down all the dogmas. He's trying to speak mm -hmm. to this particular generation at this time. So what he's emphasizing you know, he, he kind of makes a passing comment. He says that's a different form of life of the resurrection as shown in the risen Lord. That statement right there seems to save him from any sort of uh, accusation of heresy because he's clearly talking about the resurrection of the Lord, i.e. Yeah. a glorified different body, yet the same body, yet not the physical body, yet the, yet the physical body. But he doesn't go into all these Thomistic distinctions. He's simply, uh, and he's an Augustinian, that's another factor, is that in sort of a he as a writer as a theological expositor as an augustinian he is attempting to invoke the heart and bring the heart of his listeners and readers to christ and so it's not so much about let's break down all the dis different distinctions and make it all into this nice little box which is very important very important in other contexts if we're if we're gonna go into the all the basics of that but what he seems to be really getting at, and this is this is the book that made him uh, uh, world famous. Is this book was his bestseller? Which uh, book? Which book is this? This? Um, oh yeah, I was wrong. I, I thought it was uh, eschatology, but it, it is actually introduction to Christianity. Introduction to Christianity. So that that's that was his bestseller that made him famous. 
And uh, I think that what he's getting at is this, um, as you said, Rob, I think that was a great comment. Like he's, he's de-emphasizing materialism. Um, cause, cause that's, that seems to be the real question at the very beginning. Is there really such a thing as a resurrected body or can the whole thing be reduced to a mere symbol of the materiality of the person? So he's saying, yes, there is really a resurrected body. Um, but it's not a materialistic, it's not merely materialistic. Um, but it is this reconstitution of this, this greater, it's, it's kind of like corpor is this term that means just this totally physical reality, materialistic reality, mm -hmm. whereas lieb is the one or lab um, is the sacramental mystical sense, but it's still physical. Real quick, um, maybe you guys can, I mean, I don't know if we, if the church taught anything on this, but we know Adam and Eve before the fall are, are naked in the garden. We know our bodies will be glorified. Will will does it does the church teach anything about our resurrected bodies being clothed in glory and not physical clothing? Like what like I, I'm I'm curious if like the so we believe in a new world to come. Will it be any kind of material there? Or like I, I'm really curious what the church teaches on that aspect um, of it. I actually I think that was right after this and on, if I remember right. Well, yeah, there's uh, the next the next part of Ott is the composition of the body after its resurrection. So the yeah, the I have that right here. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I didn't. I it was just I I always like I, I feel like there's so many things we just take on assumption and we don't really like. Because we know so little about it. That's why I was actually really excited to do this show. Because how often do you really explore the idea of what what the next world will be for us, you know? So, all right. What does that say now, Rob? So, the, um, the, the, the paragraph or the, the statement that Tim said kind of saves Ratzinger, to me, I mean, it almost sounds very similar to this this propos this teaching right from Ott that the bodies of the just will be, you know, transfigured to the pattern of the risen Christ. And that there's actually a section from first Corinthians here that says it is so in a natural body, it shall rise a spiritual body. I mean, that's almost word for word, kind of what Ratzinger. Oh, said. let me look that up in the Greek. Let's see. This is first Corinthians 15, 44. Yep. That's a good yep. thing to look up. Yeah. Because the, the flesh decomposes, right? So, Let's see. St. Paul teaches uh, Jesus Christ will transform our lowly body to conform to his glorified body by the power that also enables him to subdue all uh, subdue all things unto himself. If it is sown in corruption, it shall rise in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it shall rise in glory. It is sown in weakness, it shall rise in power. It is sown a natural body, it shall rise a spiritual body. And so um, in the Greek... Then this is what Ratzinger kind of tried to get at, because because um, Saint Paul makes a big distinction in his writings between the sarks, the flesh, and the spirit. Um, and when he says sarks, he's referring to the fallen nature, the fallen nature of man. In this passage, it's um, he talks about how soma is um, is the term used, which means the body. Um, What's the English derivative of that? It's something, um, soma something. But soma in Greek means physical body, but it also can mean breath and spirit. So it, he also says it can mean person. Person is the most holistic English word to refer to the body and spirit of soma. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. he's in, so in, um, what's interesting here is in Greek, this is a really interesting uh, distinction here. So this is 1 Corinthians 15, 44, um, which says it is it is sown as a soma sikon or sukon, which is referring to the breath of life when when Odysseus or when the Iliad and, uh, you know, uh, the Hector is killed, his sukon comes out, he, he breathes his last. So it's it's meaning the the physical breath that that keeps you alive. So it's 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 sown. So you die as a soma sukikon, um, and then you are raised up as a soma pnevmatikon, and pnevmatikon is is spirit. That's like us. That's um, 
the Holy Spirit. That's the word for Holy Spirit, which can mean breath or spirit. So that's a really interesting usage there because he's using a very uh, a, a, an intense Greek subtlety here because Sukikon can really, as far as I know, really only means like your physical breath that you have, mm -hmm. like you're breathing your last and that's it. Whereas Pnevmatikon, uh, Pnevmatikon is the Holy Spirit. It means breath, wind. It's like the breath of God. So it's kind of like you're, I mean, maybe that's the distinction. Uh, initially, you're breathing oxygen. That's the that's the physical body. You're breathing oxygen. And in the resurrection body, the spiritual body, you are breathing the Holy Spirit. Okay. So, so I can't imagine we're wearing clothing in these spiritual bodies, right? I would imagine we are clothed in glory as Adam yeah, and Eve would have been. Glory. Um, uh, to me, that that being clothed in glory seems to be kind of an allusion to to these four aspects of a of a glorified body that being you know that being clothed in glory means that you have impassibility subtlety agility clarity i, I don't know if that's if that's how the, the church interprets that well i'm just thinking if we're elevated higher at like like we say oh happy fall right Oh, happy fall, because in Christ, we are actually elevated to a higher state than Adam and Eve were before the fall. Now, Adam and Eve are in the garden and they're naked and they saw there was no there was no scandal there. So wouldn't in when we get to heaven or into the to the, the world to come, wouldn't it be that wouldn't that be the, the case again? Uh, it would seem so based on the the gen the text of Genesis. I mean, I don't, I don't know if the church actually says that specifically, and it's, I I, it's just something I thought of. There's another aspect of um, every mass a priest is saying uh, he's when he's uh, consecrating a host and he says, this is my body. It's is, There's a great Scott Hahn talk where he actually uh, says at the end of time, Christ will come and he'll say, step aside, boys. And he'll say, this is my body and the dead will rise from their graves because we are his body, the body of the body of Christ. It was such a uh, I got chills when I heard him say it. I was like so excited, you know, hmm. that's awesome. Um, so what was there any other controversial things that you think that were going on in Benedict's? Um, well, yeah, that was that seemed to be the the basics of that um uh i think we've covered most of it i think that the, just like in english um in english it like here's another phrase in english that i think that's that is um problematic in english it says quote ratziger one thing may be fairly clear both john and paul state with all possible emphasis that the resurrection of the flesh the resurrection of the body is not a resurrection of physical bodies and so I think that that is confusing in English because he seems to be denying that your particular physical body will rise. Um, and in this case, the German is uh, the resurrection of the body, the, the lab. The, it is the lab, but not the corpor. Yeah. And so and it will still be your soma. It'll still be you. So it'll be your soma, which is your physical flesh and your spirit. Mm -hmm. It'll still be you, but it won't, won't be just like a corporate. Yeah. It's not going to just raise up the same. I I, I feel yeah, like St. Paul's distinction you, there was really good. Like what you're not going to be breathing oxygen. Yeah, this is, this is, I, I, and I feel like, I feel like Ratzinger's staying in the lines. Yeah. I, 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 I think it's I, tricky. I it's agree. difficult, but I think he's staying in the lines. Well, I think this is and, acceptable to. And actually with, with the, the, the rest of that, that section, that, that of course wasn't given to you on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. I think that to me that that makes it all honestly rather non-controversial, completely. Um, I think, especially with that last part, when he almost says word for word what Saint Paul says, it's like, well, he's just he, there's just a different emphasis there. But it's all exactly what the church teaches, as far as I can see. And and it seems like people like to clip things out of context to get a gotcha. 
oh look gotcha uh, Be- uh ratzinger didn't believe in the in the true resurrection of the body but i think that he really he was like tim said he was speaking to a very specific materialistic ge- uh, generation in that period of time and he was just trying to maybe push them to think a little deeper i mean these seem like meditations of his almost that he was you know contemplate i mean i think contemplating the you know uh what the next world will be is a really good thing One of my, my favorite rosary mystery is the coronation of mary in heaven because i love the idea of thinking about the next world and the angels and saints all you know losing it because mary is being crowned the queen of heaven and and i think that there are definitely there's areas where we're allowed to explore these ideas without being accused of being a heretic i mean yeah i think that there's to me there's um like when in my master's degree that I never finished, one thing that we studied a lot was these old Greek schisms between the uh, so-called Eastern Orthodox and the so-called Oriental Orthodox and the so-called Assyrian Orthodox. Hmm. And the various, all these, there are three different Greek schisms in the East before there was ever an East-West schism. And what modern scholarship has really brought out is that there was a, a very fierce struggle involving mob bloodshed people were killing each other over these these subtle distinctions in greek and it does seem that some of some of these people were um oh jennifer has a comment lab is definitely physical lab is the word germans used to translate the latin corpus as in the eucharist hoc est uh est nm corpus ma'am yeah i think that's what you said earlier so definitely yeah i think so it, it's not it sounds like what um what jennifer was bringing out when she we, she discussed this with me was that lab is a bigger corporate is kind of like a restricting term we're talking about corporate only the physical whereas lab is physical and spiritual and mystical and sacramental that's a bigger term that can really encompass the the greek term of soma which is really but, the main thing is that it's you it's your person body and spirit like we like when Christ says, "This is my body." He's it's his body, blood, soul, and divinity. He means all of that when he says, "This is my body." Yeah, and the, the yeah. German version of that would be Leib. Yeah, plan is such a He's worldwide. It still gives you gives no name YouTube at the time of day. <laughs> <laughs> there I, will be a get to know yeah, episode exactly. of Tim Flanders on Enoch's channel coming up soon. I, I, I hey. hope that we can I hope we can debate old school hip hop. Me and Enoch. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you, man, I really love the the community that is starting to form around the couple of different shows that we interact with, man. I think everybody's got they're all men of goodwill, all in a position of trying to be a little humble about their positions, and nobody's trying to condemn anybody else. But this, 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 real quick, something really stuck out to me when I was reading over these accounts in Scripture. This one weird thing, when Peter and John go and run to the sepulcher, and it says, Then comes Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher, and he saw the linen cloths lying. And the napkin that had been about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but apart, wrapped up into one place. What is what is going on with that? Like what? So we know. Um, would, would they put the the head thing on before they would wrap the linen body, or does the the head thing go on after that in Jewish burial? Do you guys happen to know? I don't know, but I, I what I would suggest is grabbing. Um... <clears throat> Scott Hans, uh, hope God willing, we'll have the full Bible out from Scott Hahn and Curtis Mitch. But um, I mean, I would I would look that up in which, which verse is that? Uh, that should be John twenty verses six and seven. I love this. We're just having a Bible study here. That's fantastic. <laughs> 20, yeah, I just always so John look. We're talking about the Shroud of seven. Turin. Yeah, here. John twenty verses six and seven. Now it, you're talking about the Shroud of Turin, and also what is it? The 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 Rob, what, what was the name of the other the headpiece? Uh, the the Sudarium of Oviedo. Sudarium of Oviedo. Now it's just so interesting to me that he makes a point to distinguish that the head was not lying with the, the head pe- uh, cloth was not lying with the linen clothes, but a part wrapped up into one place. Like just so, like there's always these little weird things in scripture where it's like when I see that I want to dig a little deeper and say why is he making a point to say that. So here's the note from Scott Hahn and Curtis Mitch on verse 7. This is John 27. It says, um, the napkin, the linen clothes. Here's the study note. Corroborating evidence of the resurrection. That's what that is. The napkin and the linen cloths. No thief would have taken the time to unwrap Jesus' corpse and fold his burial clothes neatly in the tomb. 
In any case, the grave robbers of antiquity usually stole the expensive linens and left the body behind, not the other way around. Wow, I'm so glad we just went over that. That makes such a <laughs> really man. If you guys go, go buy the go yeah. New Testament, just go buy it. This Absolutely, the Saint Paul Study Bible is phenomenal. Now, Katie says it's the Manapello. It's Katie. The Manapello is Veronica's cloth that she wipes Christ's right. face with on on the. Uh, uh, That's one the, name for it. Yeah, way, way to Calvary. So this is a different cloth we're talking about. Um, but yeah, so then, uh, what was the other one I, I wanted to bring up? Uh, did you just write a list of questions you've been meaning to ask Tim forever? <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, I, I, I always like just winging things. I'm not always into, but when I was reading no. the resurrection accounts, that stood out to me and I've always wondered that. And I figured you guys would be a good group to do it with. Cause I, yeah, we, dude. Well, we do have, uh, we do have one question here from someone in, Oh, office. yeah. If anybody has questions, please put them in. Um, we say Jesus and Mary are located bodily in heaven, but do we mean they live in a parallel realm along with the angels and separated souls, or do we mean they exist already in the eschaton? Um, I, I mean, I don't, first of all, I don't know, but I could guess what is meant here is that when we, because I've heard some priests tell me, like, when you die, you have the particular judgment, which is your your personal judgment, and then there's the last judgment. But the problem is when you enter eternity, eternity is the eternal now. So everything at every time is happening now. So so in a so we we separate those just because of like we're living in time. So we have to make this distinction just to make sense of it all. But in eternity, it kind of all it just all happens at the same time. So in one sense, so in terms of our reference point. From our reference point, living in time, they are in heaven, but not in the eschaton. But then from their point of view, they're, they're already all times at once. Right. So, so so that would mean basically when you die, we are all immediately at the resurrection because you're, you're outside of time at that point. So you do go through your particular judgment. And, the, and what plays into this is also purgatory, right? Because purgatory does have a temporal aspect to it. So, but yeah. Even with all of that, once all of that is done, then we all at once come to the resurrection. It's not, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really difficult topic. I think yeah, Rob I mean, and I have actually talked to, about it. It's hard to even conceptualize it. So, I mean, I, I hate to really, I, I mean, I don't know if there's anything definitive. To, I mean, I'm sure a lot of theologians have speculated on that. But um, one thing I just wanted to say, because um, I see there's another good question about cremation. It's a really good topic to bring up. Um, one thing I wanted to say was, <clears throat> when I studied all these Greek schisms is that there are some people of goodwill. And this is what I wrote in my book city of God. There are some people of goodwill who are debating with you because they disagree with the terminology that you're using because the terminology could be ambiguous. It could be misused, but they're not actually debating about the substance. So the substance of the faith, we all agree on, but we're, we're fiercely debating on what kind of terms we should use to describe this mystery, the mystery of faith. Um, so that's, that's one thing. So I think on the one hand, you do have passages like in Ratzinger, like, I think this goes to the principle of judging people on charity, trying to give a sympathetic reading to, to people like Ratzinger to reading this and thinking, well, it doesn't seem like it's that clear in English, but if we dig a little deeper, it seems to be more clear. But if we just sympathetically read it, um, I think he's just trying to find different terms to describe this mystery. Now that is uh, uh, that is a totally different thing than what the modernists do. The modernists do, like George, the, the infamous um, Irish Jesuit modernist, George Tyrrell, he said, yeah, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. But then he reinterpreted everything that what that meant. So he had a totally different meaning. So he used the same term, <laughs> but a totally different meaning. So the, yeah. the orthodox debates between the different parties are, they have the same meaning, but they're debating about the words, whereas the modernists, they use the same words just, just to trick you. They're like, yeah. oh, I believe in all the Catholic faith. I believe in the, I believe in the creed and everything, but they like, reinterpret everything. So I, I think that on the one hand, it to, to concede to your, your Sedai interlocutor, interlocutor, I mean, they're they're kind of sensitive to the modernist tactic. So that's a good thing to, to be a little bit shrewd and prudent about that. Because not everybody who's using terms that seem orthodox are really mean them orthodox, uh, but at the same time, we also need to be try to read everybody sympathetic as much as we can. Because I mean, mm -hmm. I wanted to I wanted to also concede like, what if there's a difference between 
Um, also, theologians can err. They could they could just say something that's ambiguous, or they could just get something wrong. And if but if they're doing so in good faith, that can be we can work with that because the church could correct that or clarify that or whatever. Um, there's a big difference between that and the modernists who are intentionally trying to overturn the faith by using the same terms and confuse everybody. So it's a big mess. But I mean, bottom line is like more I study Ratzinger, the more I realize my initial impression of Ratzinger was that he was a modernist or what that he was at least a revolutionary. That was my initial impression. But I, I, I found out later that as I read more and studied more and talked with people who are Ratzinger scholars, I realized that I, I had kind of given him a surface level reading and um, one, I, I, once I got past the surface, I realized that he's a lot more subtle, a lot more profound. And I think that that's like the bottom line is, do you want do you want to be judged? Viewer, listener, do you want to be judged strictly by God without mercy? I don't. Hmm. I, I'm yeah. going to need a lot of mercy. So so therefore you have to judge your brother with a ton of mercy, too, because God says that if you judge your brother without mercy and strictness, you yourself will be judged that way. So I guess like when you, when we encounter Ratzinger or anybody, we should try to give him a, a sympathetic reading. Cause I don't want to be judged. I don't want to judge Ratzinger the way I want to be judged or, you know, you know what I mean? So, yeah. And especially you know. because like, I mean, Ratzinger loved the church. You're not talking about some guy who is trying to change church teaching in this revolutionary way. I really do think he was just trying to explore these ideas and it was a time of, you know, things were going off the rails, you know, to quote our show meme that we usually do. But the church seemed to be going off the rails at this time. And there was a lot of, uh, you know, craziness. And I think that he was I think he was staying within the bounds. Especially and, speaking and he, he was betrayed by a lot of um, a lot of people in that kind of same similar school of thought that he thought were acting in good faith. Mm -hmm. And then he was shown otherwise. And I. Yeah, he says, in, he says in uh, he says in Peter Zavold quotes it in volume two, I think of the biography, he says that he was naive about Hans Kuhn. At first, mm -hmm. he thought Hans Kuhn was just kind of a, a a good guy, but then he realized he was just naive about him. And so Ratzinger was naive in certain cases. He was too trusting of some people. Uh, but to me, I think that's that's a lesser fault than being too harsh on everybody, I guess. But um <coughs> You want to talk about cremation? I think that's a good, yeah, thing to mention. Yeah, and there's um, actually Tim. But one time while you're looking that up, there was a you used to do your series on your first book. Um, the, what, what was the name of your first book? The, like the, yeah, the way the introduction to, of the Holy Bible. Like, yeah, and to read Bible. it through a traditional point of view. So you were doing this series, and I, that was one of my favorite series. By the way, you need to pick that back up and finish that. But the uh, there was one time you were, we were you were talking about uh, typology with something, and there's actually a scripture verse I'm going to want you to look up in that Saint Paul Study Bible after we talk about cremation, because I want to see if I was right about it. I remember commenting yeah, on the it. Ignatius, yeah. Ignatius, Ignatius, Ignatius. I'm sorry, Ignatius, Ignatius Study Bible. So uh, when you, when you finish cremation, I have the verse I want to pull up. Yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, yeah, I, I was looking into cremation as a part of looking at this uh, topic for the show. Um, and essentially, the if you read actually the old Catholic encyclopedia, it does. So old new advent dot org under cremation. So this is from 1908. And it's and it's discussing how the Freemasons were pushing for cremation because they de denied the resurrection of Christ or the resurrection of the dead. So they were pushing for it as a means to overcome the dogma. And the article goes through all of the uh, all of the history of the fact that um, and then the pagans also in ancient times would use cremation. Um, and so all and, and also martyrs risk their lives to bury the dead. Um, so yeah, there's something there, about burying the dead is a very Christian thing to do. Yeah. Um, that's what and that's and that's in the Old Testament with uh, with Tobit. He's, he's burying the dead. Um, and that's a work of mercy, obviously. And there's a reverence for, I mean, thinking about the saints' relics. We don't, and that's what the, again, the Mason, Masons would, they would burn all the relics. That's the Protestants do. They're yeah. destroying yeah, these right things. Um, so 
However, the article from the old Catholic Encyclopedia does state that there is nothing. So this is quoting from the article. There's nothing directly opposed to any dogma of the church in the nation in and of itself. Um, and somebody, somebody, somebody pointed out to me that sometimes we have to burn blessed objects. We bury yeah. blessed objects, but we also burn them. But so what, what, it, what the old Catholic encyclopedia is saying is that it's not intrinsically tied to a denial of the dogma, but it's been used by the enemies, enemies of Christ to deny the dogma. And so that, and that's partially the reason why the church has always opposed it, but it's partially because burying the dead is the more fitting way. It's certainly more fitting. And it seems that the church has only allowed cremation over the years for some immense grave cause, like a plague, plague victims are all uh, yeah. rotting corpses. You know, there, there would be a, a sanitary reason where we're, that could be allowed at that point. So in the sense that it's not intrinsically evil in and of itself, um, but it should be opposed uh, in almost every case. The problem yeah. is that nowadays pretty much there's, it's unfortunately a widespread practice and uh, there's really, there's not a lot of reverence for the body and giving the body a proper burial. Um, yeah, because they, they they will cremate a person and then go spread their ashes in oh yeah that's all over the place. I mean that's a, right. Yeah, yeah, it's a terrible thing. The uh, okay, yeah, yeah, I was just gonna pull that up, Rob. Okay, so follow up question for Tim. I do hear people speak of heaven as the eternal now, but couldn't we make a distinction between the divine nature, a temple, versus the divine realm that was created in Genesis one? Hmm. Um, are you referring to? So the sorry, you're saying a divine. I'm not sure exactly what you mean. It sounds like you're saying there's a divine realm in which God inhabits of the created order in terms of like the firmament, or God is above the firmament. Um, so God is in the created order because He created some of the created order to inhabit Himself. Whereas there's always, as uh, I think Saint John says, that God dwells in light inaccessible. Um, it's. I, I, it sounds like if I understand you correctly. Yes, <laughs> that we could make a distinction between those two things. Yes, but I think that we're, you know, we're just getting into areas where it's a mystery. Like we know it happens. We know it's there. We know that they're in heaven, but we know that that heaven itself is a mystery, too. So we can't be too definite on all the specifics, even though theologians can speculate on, on our certain aspects. Um, there was... Uh... Uh, when we were reading before, it was. Let me just see real quick because I don't want to lose the other verse that I want. Uh, one John three two. Oh, here's a here's kind of a clarification in just a second here if it shows up. There we go. I guess what I'm trying to get at is Tim's view of the bodily ascension slash assumption. Are these bodies, the bodies of Christ and of the Blessed Virgin Mary, located physically somewhere right now? That's a good question. I don't, I don't really know if there is uh, any sort of church teaching or if the saints and fathers and scholastics have really tried to solve that. Um, because we know that in the Old Testament, uh, we know one th some things that we know is that we know that the, the bodies and souls of all the Old Testament patriarchs went to the grave or Sheol, which is the place that everybody went to that place. It was also mm -hmm. called Hades. It, it was, it was a, a place for everybody to go except for people like Elijah or Enoch. They got translated. So where exactly they went, I don't think that's entirely clear, but we know that everybody else went to this Sheol place. And we know that Christ descended to hell, descended to Hades, not Gehenna, but Hades, to bring all these people up and preach to the souls who were in prison, as St. Peter says. And the Greek icon of the resurrection has him bringing up Adam and Eve from Sheol. Um so we would assume then that they brought he brought up their bodies from Sheol, that they were resurrected and that they were brought to where wherever Mary's Mary is in her assumption, which is in heaven at the beatific vision. Are they physically somewhere? I, yes, I yes, yes and no, I guess. I mean, well, we know Mary is because Mary has appeared. Right. And has there been apparitions of saints also? Yeah, of course. There's yeah, been like, apparitions uh, of saints. Of Arc. Well. Yeah. And um yeah, some saints um, talking to, to the earlier point we were talking about before, I know the, the church was saying um we will be like 
Christ. So that in first John three, it says, dearly beloved, we are now the sons of God and it hath not yet appeared what we shall be. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. So I think that has a lot, uh, has to do with what we're talking about as well. Right? Like when we, we're working now to try to be, I think that would be like theosis for the the Eastern church, right? Like we will be, we, we don't yet know what we will be, but we will be like him. And, and I think the deification is what we're working towards. Yeah. The beatific vision is the vision of God as he is insofar as we can see him uh, in an elevated divinized state so that grace perfects our nature so that we can truly see him yeah okay all right so the the verses i wanted you to look up so what happened was you were you were actually teaching us from your book and you were going over the story of rehoboam and rehoboam uh he's um uh he's the son of uh saul right roboam is yeah he's the son of solomon because jeroboam is, Sol is solomon. The, solomon yeah <clears throat> So okay. what happens is he is the people come to him and they ask him for some some leniency. And he says, not only am I not going to be lenient, but I have more. I'm uh, My little pinky is stronger than my father's loins. Like he actually makes a, a dirty joke in scripture about about his father being like having no no. Uh, I don't want to say cojones. It. Yeah, cojones. <laughs> because my little finger is bigger than my father's loins, you know. And he and he and he says double their burden, and he gives them a heavy burden. And I said in that show, I said, "Hey, is that a reference to Matthew eleven twenty eight, where it says, "Come to me, all you that labor and are burdened, and I will refresh you. Take my yoke upon you." And learn of me because I am meek and humble of heart, and you shall find rest in your souls. So there's a very specific thing that Rehoboam, uh, he doubles their yoke. And I always wondered if I, like, it, the way you were explaining it made me think of the the, the saying of Jesus. And I, I, I remember throwing the comment up, but I, I wonder if that's actually a reference to to that. Uh, what's the verse on the? on the Matthew 11, 11. 20, 28 and 29. Okay, so so Han and Mitch say on those verses, Jesus invites disciples to follow and learn from him as the model of perfect obedience to the Father. Jesus evokes wisdom's invitation to the humble in the Old Testament in Sirach 51. Wisdom calls, draw near to me, put your neck under the yoke, Sirach 51, 26, and see with your eyes that I have labored little and found for my, myself much rest. These parallels reinforce Jesus' self-identification as wisdom in eleven nineteen. Um, as with as with all passages of scripture, there can be many many different layers. So I, I would not I would not. Yeah, that might not be parallel, a full. I don't think this precludes the fact that Roboam right there. Yeah, um, because there's also the he says that you when he condemns the Pharisees and the Sadducees later on in the same gospel, he says you burden uh, people and you don't lift a finger to help them. I have heard a historical interpretation of this, wherein there was a term called the yoke, which is what rabbis would use when they told their disciples all the extra commandments that the rabbis would give. Because we have all the commandments of Moses, but then the rabbis would give extra commandments in order to keep those commandments. And uh, our Lord makes mention of this because he, he says, like, you wash your hands and all this stuff. Those were those extra commandments, those, like, yeah. this yoke. Yeah, and Raka, so, like... He says you follow the you follow the, the the laws of men. He says you you know you do Raka, which I think Raka was a way for them to instead of following the command to honor your mother and father, it was a way for them to work around Corban. keeping their yeah. What was it? Corban. 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 Yeah. Not Raka. Raka is fool. Raka is the yeah. fool. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Raka is fool. <laughs> it was Corban, where it was a way for them to work around by putting their money in the temple so that they didn't have to actually care for their yeah. their uh, honor their mother and father, and th those are those little rules that they were. So I mean I think that 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 can definitely be a parallel to Robaum too, because he's definitely um, overburdening them. Yeah, he overburdens them. He gives them. He says, "Make their yokes even stronger." And I always thought Jesus was saying that to call people's mind back to the last king, who was burdening them and overburdening them. And no, 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 take my yoke upon you, all you who are 
heavy burdened mm -hmm. and I will give you rest because those people went to him and asked him for rest. And he said, no, no way. I'm not giving you rest. I'm doubling. Right. Yeah. They him. asked, they, they did come to him. Yeah. That that's a good, yeah. They came I, to him and asked I for mercy. See the parallel because they came to him and he yeah. overburdened them. So. Where Jesus says, come to me. I will not overburden you. So yeah. dude, this and was a fun. The son, I mean, Jesus is the son of Robam too. That's what I mean. He's yeah. uh, so he's the new descendant of that king. Yeah. I, that it, it just seemed like that was something. And uh, whatever. He's the new David, <laughs> the new Solomon, and the new Robo. That's yeah. that's fantastic. I like it. So, um, this was a really fun show, man. I I, I feel like it cleansed the palate after the last two, Rob. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> we needed something wholesome to bring back to the channel. Tim, we always love having you on, man. Um, we were talking in the green room a little. We may do something a little different. I'm meaning a Catholic, not just trivia. So we do owe you a trivia show. We're going to probably put that together in the next week or so. Maybe next week. We'll see. Because uh, we do have to finish our last chosen review. So we'll do that this week. And then we have we have one more question here real quick. Sorry. Okay. Tim mentioned Elijah. Would you discuss resurrection in the full context of the transfiguration? Hey, that's a that's a great parallel that Michael brought out. Thanks, Michael. I mean, um, the first I all I had here was um, <clears throat> this kind of brings at this mystery that we just mentioned, the mystery of where is Elijah exactly physically, but because clearly he appeared. Um, so, you know, was he like transported like Star Trek style or, you know, was he <laughs> transport? He got his chariot in, came to Mount Tabor. I don't know. Um, so beat me up, what, Elijah. What was that? Beam me, Beam up, me Elijah. up, Elijah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me for the show, everybody. Beam me up, Elijah. Um, well, he says in in Ot, there is the claritas, the glory uh, of the of the resurrected body, that is being free from everything deformed. The just shall shine as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Matthew thirteen forty three, and he, it says this: the model of the glorification is the transfiguration of Jesus on Tabor, after and after the resurrection. Um, so there is a, uh, here, Ott continues, the intrinsic reason for the transfiguration lies in the overflowing of the beauty of the transfigured soul onto the body. Wow, that's profound. The measure yeah. of the glorification of the body, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 41, will vary according to the degree of clarity or claritas glory of the soul, which is in proportion to the measure of the merits. And that's from, you can look that up in St. Thomas in the supplement 85 1 so there is um the in the greek in the greek rite oh thank you rob in the yep. greek rite there is this the glorious antiphon of our lady is more honorable than the so speaking to our lady it says more honorable than the cherubim and beyond compare more glorious than the seraphim and so our lady is is saying that her, her glory is beyond the highest of angels um and that's exactly what these these merits are saying <clears throat> uh you know the glory exceeds this um so but that's kind of a, not to exactly to to michael's question here um but clearly i think the transfiguration shows us that um christ's appearance in the flesh <laughs> is 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 the very thing that ratzinger says at the end of his section that was cut out in the initial quote and that there is this reconstitution of all things in Christ. And so you have Elijah and you have Moses uh, present in, I mean, maybe that's what they're seeing. They're seeing the resurrected body now of Elijah and Moses. Um, I, I always wondered during Christ's transfiguration, is that some kind of a thing where Moses is up, at the top of the mountain and he's so like you you see elijah's raised up to heaven you see moses has this theophany experience with the with the cloud when he goes to get the ten commandments maybe they're all meeting at that one place outside of space and time like we're you know there there could be something going on there i don't know hmm. it's so funny so, somebody mentioned the star wars first ghost and that that's <laughs> at the end of uh the the late the 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 final edition of Return of the Jedi, they put Anakin Skywalker back in his original, uh, like yeah. the prequels or whatever, because initially it was the old guy, and then they put him back, which is exactly what we're saying. <laughs> get your young body back before you turn to the dark side. That's what you get. That's oh, funny. Anthony loves Star Wars talk. Yeah, Star Wars. Oh. <laughs> I have an epic debate 
I, the next avoided battle on uh, Star Wars and Star Trek conversation. I'm a Star Trek guy. Oh, you are a Trek guy. I'm oh. a Trek guy. I'll take Trek. I'm not crazy about. I'm not crazy about the the recent Picard series, but I was a big Next Generation fan. Oh, dude, absolutely. You just, I, I mean, I just I just checked out after after um, DS9 and Voyager. After that, it's mm. I, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I recycle those three. But Next Generation, I grew up on. I mean, I would oh, watch yeah. it like every night, you know. So, oh but the, yeah, <laughs> the card the card series they just put out recently, like season one was all right, but then the way it ended was just so terrible. I didn't even check season two out. So I checked out of Discovery after Discovery like became R rated. I was like, what the heck is this? This is like this is not family friendly Trek anymore. Like, did you ugh. watch Enterprise? I I did not watch much much of that. I, I, I but I understand that it's okay. It's not it, it's, it's not okay, terrible, yeah. but it's okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Tim, thank you so much, man. This was a great show. Dude, if I, if you want to put it up on Meaning a Catholic, Rob will send you the, the, the file for it if you want to throw it up there. Because yeah, I think this would be a good fit for your channel, man. Yeah, man. Right on. So, uh, it's always, question. always a pleasure. Yeah. Are those real, real books behind you? Yes, those are real books <laughs> behind Tim. <laughs> no, they're, they're spiritual books. They're, they're, <laughs> spiritual they're, they're lame. No, not, not, uh... they're not corporal. They're spiritual <laughs> yeah. books. I, well, uh, well, don't give me credit because I haven't read them all. <laughs> I hope you guys all enjoyed this. If you guys catch this on the replay, leave us a couple of comments below. If you guys want us to do some more topics like this, maybe you guys will see something different from us on Meaning a Catholic. Rob, we have anything we got to promote? Uh, well, we'll have a chosen review sometime next week. The trivia show sometime next week. and that, That's all okay. we got. Tim, what do you got coming up on Meaning a Catholic? Um, oh, you have Burke, Dan Burke coming on Monday, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm excited. Oh, yeah, that's cool. We're we're we have uh two two Lent challenges. Uh, one is the mental prayer challenge, which we're gonna announce on Monday, which is for Lent. You start you start doing 50 minutes per day of mental prayer. Now, I'm really bad at mental prayer. I've never been able to crack the code of mental prayer, so I'm excited for this, and then. There is the other challenge is the spiritual reading challenge, which is where we're gonna we're gonna challenge trads to read uh, Cardinal Sarah Power of Silence, which is fantastic text, but it's not quote unquote trad. And then we'll tr we'll challenge the sort of conservative John Paul II whatever kind of Catholics to read the latest edition of uh, translation of Thomas Kempis, which is um, Meditations on Death. Nice, nice and trad. <laughs> so <laughs> that'll be our spiritual reading challenge. So we'll be reading through that for Lent. I will read through the entire text of death um, for our Fellowship of St. Anthony. And um, so, for, yeah, Fellowship of St. Anthony, if you want to join, that's coming up soon. Uh, we take take on fasting and abstinence beyond what the church requires of us, but we all do it together to help each other. Uh, so if you want to join that. Yeah, yeah, guys, please yeah. go and join the Meaning of Catholic Guild. Like, if there's any channel that I, what me and Rob do is kind of goofy here, but Tim's actually, you know, he's the reason we got into this. And uh, it, it, Tim, Tim's just he was, you know, him and Jeremiah were my first two interviews. I love Tim's book, but the Saint Anthony's Guild last year, I, I was a part of, and I read the book about Saint Anthony, uh, you know, Saint Anthony's actual life, the life of Saint oh, Anthony. The desert. And it was transformative. That yeah, book Saint is Anthony of the Desert, not of Padua. Right. Right. Yeah. It's transformative, that book. It's a it's a it's a really easy read, too, but it just really uh grounded me last Lent. It, I, I was able to do things that I never thought I was able to, and we all stuck to it, and we all were there to help each other through it. Uh so the, the telegram is really awesome as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been a great blessing. It's really um definitely a consolation for me to have this group so it's fantastic yeah all right man tim thank you so much for coming on rob want to take us out okay have a good day everyone unite the clans enoch let's go yo yo uh take me back to my 